future promises are designed to give us a present hope. And that was the message and the purpose of Isaiah. 700 years in advance of the coming of one who would be born of a virgin, who would come to give his very life. This message from Isaiah is a message of deep longing in the heart of a prophet who knows what God's preferred future and ideal is for his people. And yet he sees and understands what God's people are experiencing. The darkness that was hovering over their land was not the darkness that existed at the setting of the sun, but it was a darkness that was just the prelude to what was to occur in the years to come. In the rising of the sun, as he would come with healing in his wings, the Lord Jesus Christ would fulfill all the promises of the Old Testament. And this is the message of Isaiah. 700 years in advance. I'm amazed at the intricacy of Scripture as you see it, as you see it unfolding itself. Every single detail, Isaiah chapter 9, we find ourselves in today. Yes, we looked at Isaiah 7 last week. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What a wonderful promise to a people that had turned their back upon the Lord. What a, what a wonderful promise, even to a king who had chosen to use his own human engineering to bring about a solution to his problem, yet God had a greater solution. The solution would not come in the form of a conquering king, but would come in the form of a child who would come into this world and bring life and joy and eternal life. And so as you take your Bible, would you turn to Isaiah chapter 9? Isaiah chapter 9, because this passage of Scripture and so much history, so much detail that we find in this marvelous passage of Scripture that we find for ourselves, beginning in actually chapter 8 in verse 22, when Isaiah says, And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into deep or thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought her into contempt, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. This initial promise of Isaiah was a promise that was designed to encourage them. There was this picture of despair that we see emerging from Isaiah's writing and particularly in these verses as well, this darkness. He uses the word, Isaiah does, darkness four different times in our English translation. There are actually four different Hebrew words which represent this. This is a time of deep darkness. The people have chosen to dwell in it. That means it's not just that it's dark, it's that it's growing more dark. It's becoming darker. Death and destruction has ravaged the land as the Assyrians from the northeast have come in already. He speaks of it as a present reality. The truth is, is that it is yet to occur. That the Assyrians who would come in and destroy the northern kingdom, this is yet to occur, but he speaks of it as a certainty. It's going to happen. It's so certain to happen. He writes of it. He speaks of it as though it already has. And that's how God's promises are. In fact, in the Hebrew mindset, that's exactly how they thought about God's promises. So certain to occur that they would speak of them as a present reality. A way of understanding that God's promises are certain. You can count on them and speak of them not as something that are going to happen, but things that are going to take place, but things that, that we can live as though they're already occurring in the present. The future promises have present uh, present um, implications to our lives. And the Bible says that they were dwelling, according to verse 2, that they were dwelling, that they were, literally it means that they were, they sat down in this darkness. They, they settled into it. They, it became sort of a way of life for them, this idea that, that, that they would just simply do life according to their own plan, according to their own desire. There's this great picture of despair that you find painted in, in Isaiah, but there's this deep sense of longing that he's trying to encourage in his writing. He wants them to know out of this darkness, there is going to emerge this great light. 
that there is one who is coming and he will dispel the darkness. This is exactly what Jesus did in John's gospel in the eighth chapter. When he announced his public ministry, he did so and he declared himself to be the light who had come into the world. This is exactly what he's doing. He's fulfilling and John knows this and so he writes with this as a backdrop to his own writing. But they're in a place of deep despair. They've chosen to live this way. They have chosen to sit in, to settle down. This is literally the idea. They chose to dwell in a place of darkness, to remain there. Even though they knew what God had been saying to them, they chose to settle down into this place and get comfortable with living life apart from God. This is what they chose. But Isaiah wanted them to understand something much different. Then in light of God's judgment upon them, there was this emerging hope, this design that God was not through with them. This was the meaning of his two sons. Did you go up? Did you go last week and look up the names of Isaiah's children? The first, a remnant shall return. And then the second one in chapter 8, an interesting, well, might be difficult to pronounce, but swift and speedy. In other words, there will be a remnant who will return to the land, but God will ultimately bring judgment to the land. That's what he's doing. He's bringing judgment into the land because they have refused him. They've settled in and they've sat down and they've decided they're going to be comfortable with living life apart from God, even though they carried with it the trappings of religion and the religion of their day. We know that even Ahaz himself, a religious man, but yet a man who is willing to sacrifice his own son to the gods of Moloch and sacrifice him in the fire. And so these were people who were in a deep sense of of despair, affliction and adversity and deep anguish is actually the word that that he uses here, that there was this great anguish. There was this longing in their heart that there had to be something better than or greater than. And there was a remnant who held to this belief that God was not through. He, He was not he was not through with them, that his promises still remained. This is the story of Christmas. God's promises still remain. Jesus, born into this world, is fulfilling hundreds of years of prophecy, of promises made. I know it seems like, well, we know this story, but do we know this story really? Do you know it well enough to tell your children and your grandchildren? Do you know it well enough to tell the person that you work with? To actually offer them something more than just a little tagline like Jesus is the reason for the season. We got it. (laughs) But there's more to the story, right? I mean, there's something more. There's something more fascinating than that tagline. There's something more deeper than that that we are to explain. I was visiting with someone and I don't know. It may very well be here in our services this morning. I didn't see him, but someone at the gym. And trying to explain to him what exactly this passage of scripture meant. He said, what are you going to be talking about? We visit a little bit about it. And trying to communicate without sounding like a preacher, you know. Or sounding preachery. Just say, hey man, you know, this is what it's about. All of these prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ. Hundreds of years in advance that Jesus comes. And he fulfills this word that was spoken of him way in advance of his coming. This is why we believe. That we have this sure word of prophecy, this remarkable word. And so there's this remarkable word that begins to emerge. Even amidst the picture of despair, we see this grace of God. And ultimately, the character of God begins to surface throughout, of, throughout all of this. And so when we, think about, when we think about God's dealing with his people, we think about how he is actually dealing with them. And how does he deal with them? He could deal with them in ultimate judgment. That that's not what he does. Because he deals with them in a message of grace and hope and a message that lifts their expectations and helps them to see that whatever God deals with, whatever he does in judgment, he does so because he ultimately cares, because he ultimately wants to stir a slumbering people who decide that they want to sit down and get comfortable in the the depth of darkness and the plummeting of darkness and what it can mean in our lives. Just how deep will we go as human beings? And yet look how marvelous God's grace is in our life that he would leave the glory of heaven and he would come down and he would dwell among us. That he would come down and pitch a tent, John 1, 14, and he would tabernacle among us. This is this Jesus 
who's come to dwell among us, to reside among us. That is, he's lowered himself down here, Philippians 2. He's humbled himself and he's come down and he's lowered himself into the depth of our despair and our darkness. That is the choices that brought about all of the depth of sin that we have plummeted to. Jesus lowered himself into this place and he gave himself. And he gave himself the message of grace. The message of the goodness of God. We see this pattern of hope beginning in verse 2. And it continues to describe the people who have walked in darkness. There, in other words, there's not, no longer going to be any gloom. They were in anguish. There's this emerging sense in which God is delivering his people. The people who walked in darkness, they've seen a great light. There's this illumination that has occurred. It's not as though they created the light. This is not self-discovery. This is not a seminar that they went to and it was sort of like, we got it now, right? This wasn't a book that they picked up and they read, but there, there is this illumination by the Holy Spirit of God who's now going to bring light into their darkened world to help them see, to help them understand, to help them to believe, to help them to recognize so that when this one, the Messiah, would come, they would see him, they would recognize him, and they would know him, and certainly many did, while others did not. Those who dwelt in a land of deep, deep darkness, on them a light has shone. This is a, a beautiful picture because the tribes of the north that, that he describes, Zebulun and, and Naphtali in, in verse 1, these tribes of the north invariably were the very places when they were going to be invaded, armies of the north particularly would come into this land as a plush and fertile land. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a land that, that ultimately, because of the geography, because of the lushness of the land, because of its trade routes, because of a lot of different reasons, invariably, the armies of the north would come and they would invade. So invariably, you would find Zebulun, the tribe of the north, and Naphtali, they would be the first to be invaded. And so they would also be the first to embrace whatever the culture, whatever the religion, whatever the political system. They were basically at the whim of whoever the invading country was. And he's saying this is, this is the land that has invariably been the first to bear the weight of impending uh, 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 invasion of other nations. They would bear the weight of it, while the tribes of the south... In, they would eventually deal with it, but not to the extent of these tribes of the north. And he's saying, this place of darkness, this place in which God's judgment has fallen, nations have invaded time and time and time again, this would be the place in which a light would shine in the darkness. And in Matthew's gospel, if you have your Bible, turn there, Matthew chapter 4. It's an interesting passage of scripture because it announces the public ministry of Jesus. And where does he go after his temptation? Matthew chapter 4, look at this in verse 12, Matthew 4, verse 12. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, the two northern tribes that we were just described by Isaiah. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven as at hand. He's saying he's that light. He's the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. This is, what, this is what the scripture is telling. This is what Matthew's writing. That he's fulfilling that these tribes of the north, which invariably would be weighted by the burden of invading countries, now are experiencing the very presence of Jesus, the light. Where darkness has abided, the light has come. And Christ has come to fulfill Isaiah's prophecy. And so we see this picture of despair, this, this pattern of hope back in Isaiah chapter 9 that begins to emerge. Look in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. Where there was once despair, there's going to, there's going to be joy. 
Isaiah's interested in this theme of joy and peace, by the way. He uses the word joy 24 times in his writing. He wants them to know that while you've been in despair and affliction and, and you've been in anguish, there is this joy that the, this promised one is going to bring to your life. And certainly he has brought to your life if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you have increased its joy. They have rejoiced before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of, for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. He's talking about not just joy. This is the result of the one who's coming, bringing the light. This is the result of the Messiah who's coming. The sense of anticipation, the sense of a longing. We're emerging out of darkness. There is a sunrise that is going to occur. There is a hope that is emerging. And there is this joy that emerges from despair. And there is this deliverance that is emerging from a sense of deep burden and oppression that the people had experienced time and time again. We know the cycle of God's people. When they disobey the Lord, Lord, invariably what would happen is God would bring an oppressor that's what he did and whether it be the Assyrians or whether it be the Babylonians or the Romans and the list goes on of varying people groups that he used nations that he used he brought oppressors but he's saying there's coming one who's going to deliver you from your oppressor and he's going to bring deliverance out of your sense of uh, out of your sense of burden and then he cites Judges 7 in the story of Gideon and Midian and you'll have to look at that in your own time. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. He's talking about there's coming a time of peace. This conflict that you have constantly been in, this battling back and forth in your own, the context. Remember, we said it last week, is that Ahaz has negotiated this, this deal with the Assyrians, and it's not what God wanted at all, but it's what he decided he wanted to do. Remember, you know, it's what he wanted to do, and so oftentimes that's how we are. We negotiate something that we think is a better plan than God's plan, but in the end of it, in the result of it, is the conflict that came to Ahaz and to the people of God. What he's saying to them is there's coming a time when peace will emerge out of the conflict. This is coming to you, another word that Isaiah uses frequently in the scripture. And then in verse 6, for unto us, and this is the passage that we know, this is the passage that we have printed and we have it in our homes and we can recall this and so what I've spoken to you so far is things you may not quite recall but this is the verse that you know for to us a child is born so what is God's response to a country that is in conflict and raging in war you would think it would be a conquering king but that's not God's response it's an innocent child it's a child born into this world for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look at the descriptions that we are so familiar with. Encouraging passages of Scripture. But when he says, for unto us a child is born, he's speaking of it in the present tense once again. In other words, this is going to occur with such certainty, it, with such certainty that we're going to speak of it as a present reality. Living your life in light of the certainty of the future promises of God. And, and this is the nature of the Hebrew language. When Isaiah writes these words, he writes it in the, in the perfect tense. It's, it's what's called what the theologians or what scholars call the prophetic perfect. perfect. It means that it's so certain to occur that you can absolutely count on it in the present. And their way of thinking, this is exactly what they thought, that this is, this is true, this is, this is coming, he is coming. There is a certain reality to the coming of this one. For unto us a child is born. A light will come to those who are living in darkness. He will defeat the nations and those who oppress them. A new king, a new son will come and he will ever expand this promise made to God's people of old, established in David and reaffirmed time and time again in the scripture as he would expand this kingdom upon the earth. Exactly what Jesus would do for us. And 
What would he be called? Wonderful Counselor. Now, there's a great depth of meaning in just these, these terms that we'll take a few moments and look at. Wonderful Counselor. There's the profound nature of the person of Jesus Christ. He's profound indeed. There's one, he is wonderful. That is, he is full of wonder, glorious. He is extraordinaire. In other words, he's exceptional. There's no one like him. He is incomparable. He is the wonderful counselor. There is no greater one that you could place your thinking before. There's no greater one that you could bring your life before and offer that to him and seek his guidance and his direction, but certainly even more than that, that he would guide you and direct you, but he would protect you as one who stood guard at your right hand or on your left hand. He is your counselor in some translations, in some ways of understanding this. One could say he is the wonderful Counselor, the one who consults with us in our days of affliction, in our days of challenge, in our, je- in our days of war and battle. He is the great advisor who consults with us. There is a great war that is raging for our soul, is there not? For your family, for your life, for your future. And he is the wonderful counselor who can come in and guide you. And so he is profound in all that he does, in all of our decisions, in all of our details of life. He is the one who can step in and offer us grace and the goodness of the Lord. He is mighty God. Another description of him. While he is our great source of wisdom, there is nothing impossible with the mighty God. There is no one like him. While his riches are unparalleled and and the knowledge of the Lord is unfathomable, there is nothing like the mighty hand of God. He is strong. He is powerful. There is no one that we could actually call upon who could actually bring us strength that is all the resources necessary to, to abide in the place where we abide, to live in the place where we live, to face life as we face it. There is no one greater than him who is capable as the mighty God to offer us all that we need is our valiant warrior. The psalmist said it this way, who is this one? But he is, in Psalm 24, he is the Lord, strong and mighty. That's who he is. Capable and at our side. Strong and mighty. He is powerful indeed. He is preeminent. And there is no one ultimately that can prevail against the mighty God that we believe in. He is strong But also we see that he is the everlasting father. He is the everlasting father. And so there's this personal quality that we see. He is always with us, will always be with us. He is omnipresent. He is with us, abiding with us. When we we cease to imagine a day in which time exists, when time is out of our mind, that's literally what it means for one to be forevermore. That he is everlasting. When, when we imagine a time when we can no longer contemplate it, we can no longer think of it. In time, time eternal, time future, time past. When we, when we think of those times and they create these bookends of how we're able to think God exists outside those barriers. He's forever more for us. That's who he is. That's the idea. He's personal. Yes, he cares for us. He is our everlasting father. He's always there, abiding with us, dwelling with us, caring for us. He is, in a sense, he is the one who is overseeing our lives, and he has no limitation for our lives, and he has no limitation himself. Isaiah said this in chapter 57 and verse 15, Thus saith the one who inhabits eternity. The one who is speaking to them is the one who inhabits forever. That one who inhabits the forever is capable of dealing with the now. The one who is capable of standing outside of our time and space is capable of now intervening, stepping into, and doing something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Now, I don't know about you. But I don't know anyone on this earth who's capable of standing outside of my circumstances, getting the right perspective on it. He's everlasting and caring enough about me to now step into my mess because that's exactly what I've created and now trying to do something for me that I cannot do for myself. But that's him. He's personal and he's profound indeed and he is powerful. But he is also peaceful. He is peaceful. He is the prince 
of peace. Isaiah uses this word peace. He uses the word peace 25 times. It's the Hebrew word shalom. You're probably familiar. One of the few Hebrew words you might be familiar with, but that would be one. The peace, the chief of peace, the chief of of shalom, the, the one who's capable of stepping into a world abiding in conflict, oppressed by nations. What is it about this world that we live in? We think we're progressing. We think we're evolving. We think that somehow humanity is, we're, we're getting to a better place. And that never have we seen greater oppression in the history of humanity than what we see now. There's no peace. There's no shalom in this world apart from the Lord. When men try to abide in their own peace, invariably it creates conflict because someone is trying to get over on another person. And whether it be through power or whether it be through prosperity or whatever it might be, through position, they're trying to get one leg up on the next person. And that's the nature of humanity. And you can see it in terms of individual, interpersonal relationships, but you can see it in relationships between nations. That there's a sense in which we have to somehow have this technology or this power or this bomb or this whatever. And so that we can place ourselves in a greater position. So that we might not be taken advantage of. Or if we would like to, we could take advantage of you consuming whatever you might have for our benefit. And the list goes on of human problems. And what is Isaiah saying that this one who's come, it will come as the prince of peace. He will come as the one who is chief of this of this economy. He's chief of this abiding sense of presence that he will bring, that he will bring that if you will believe that he will establish himself as the one who brings peace. There will be peace. Ephesians 2 talks about the peace that we will have with one another. Let me read these verses for you. For he himself is our peace, speaking of Jesus Christ. A peace that Ephesians says that is only brought about through the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He's talking about this dividing wall of hostility that exists between ethnicities, between Jew and Gentile and so forth. What he's saying is ultimately the solution to the division among us is the Lord Jesus Christ. He brings peace. He brings this peace to us. The Bible tells us not only in in Ephesians chapter 2, but in Romans 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just peace with one another, but it's peace with God. it's, It's not just that we would have this peace with one another. That's a good thing, but it can only be established if we have peace with God. And that peace exists because the Lord Jesus Christ came and he died. He shed his blood for us to experience that. That peace that we have with God is a peace that passes all understanding. Paul would write about in Philippians 4. A peace that passes all understanding so that we're, when we are in our deepest sense of inner turmoil, we can, we can reside in the fact that God's got this. Seemed like I've heard somebody say that here recently. God's got this, right? He's got it. And so we have the peace of God And we have the peace with one another and we have peace. The angel said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And the list goes on. This is a marvelous passage of scripture, but this peace is not something you can experience just because, you know, you want to have it. It's a peace that exists because he's made it possible. It's a peace that exists because because he has paid a price for us to experience this profound, powerful, personal, peaceful person who has come to us, this this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, this chief of peace wants you to have it. Now, will you receive it? Will you believe it? Will you call upon the name of the Lord? Will you ask him for this peace? Because if you will ask him for this peace, he will come and abide in your life. Isaiah says this, Of the increase of his government, of his oversight, and of peace, there will be no end. If you experience the peace of God, there's no end to it. There's no place in which you'll run out of it. There's not a time in which it will cease to exist. The idea, Isaiah 
painting the picture of a world that is going to continue to expand, that once Christ comes, he has come, that when he comes, he will establish his kingdom upon the earth that will continue to expand until his second coming and beyond. Because this Prince of Peace is in the line of the King of David. He is in fulfillment of everything spoken of and the expansion of all that God ever intended will continue to take place for those who believe in the Prince of Peace. Bow your heads with me, will you please? I don't know where you are today, but maybe there's a time of apprehension in your life. Things are going on that you were just not, you didn't bargain for those things. You were not looking for those things. And yet this promise of the coming king allows you to anticipate and believe. Not, not just to believe that he came, but to anticipate that he's coming. Because his first advent is one of the mountaintops in which we see our great king. But there is another the Bible tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again and at his second advent, the second coming in Revelation chapter 19, that at the second coming of Christ, we have something to anticipate, something, something to embrace, that our, feel, our, our, our faith in him allows us to overcome the fears of our life, the phobias, the things that we face. You might even have the fear today that there's no way that God could forgive you. You may think there's just no way. I've done so many things. I've done this. I've done that. And you know exactly. You have a list. And where you fail to remember some of those things on that list, Satan is, he's somebody who is an accuser of the brethren. And he, he, he never forgets that list. He just seems to bring it up about the time you think you... You've forgotten a few of those. He brings it up. He just reminds you. And he said, see, pastor, that's why those things that I'm thinking about right now, that, that's why I, 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 there's just no hope for me. And I'm telling you today, there is every reason to have hope. There's every reason to have hope. Because your faith in this king, this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, this prince of peace, your faith in him, is what brings salvation to your, to your heart, to your home. All you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord. Call upon Him. That's God's grace working in your life. That's God's goodness. We've seen this. God's goodness. The Bible says the goodness of the Lord leads us to repentance. And so what God does is that through His grace and through His goodness, He wants to do a third thing in your life. It's a reflection of what he wanted to do then, what he wants to do now, what he wants to do forever. He wants to set up a government. I'm not talking about a human system of government. He wants to oversee your life. He wants to give you a sense of direction. He wants to set up his principles, his laws. He, these are the things he wants you to live by. He wants to govern you. He doesn't want to oppress you. He's not a dictator. He's not trying to manipulate you. He wants to govern you in a good way. That's who he is. And he governs you. He governs me. And it brings about abundance. An abundant life. Jesus said this, I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. But the thief, he comes forth to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you're here today, you have a choice. Would you like that life that Jesus offered? Or would you like the alternative? It's a place of darkness. Please don't sit there. Don't settle there. Don't stay there. Trust in the Lord now, right now. Lord Jesus, you are welcome in this place. We worship you. There's no one like you. This is what it's all about. And Lord, I pray for those that in this quiet moment that they are calling out to your name, knowing that there is no other name that has been given among men whereby they can be saved. That there's power in your name and that they would call upon you and they would trust you for all the things that you've said and more that they have yet to even hear. That salvation would come to the hearts of those who are believing in you even now. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.